As I walked toward the exit, Pat called after me. Hey, didn't you want to tell us something when you came in? I looked at him at the way the shadows fell across his face. He was leaning on the roof of the car, which was unmarked cop car blue. That was probably why the shadows in the hollows of his eyes, his upper lip, his throat looked blue. I forget now, I said. It'll come back to me. Pat Sorry, sunshine. I raised a hand and turned away again. He said softly, see you. He could have meant only that he'd see me at Charlie's, where we'd seen each other for years. But I knew that wasn't what he meant. I went for a long walk. I spiraled slowly through Old Town, from the outside edge, where SOF headquarters and City Hall lie on the boundary between Old Town and Downtown, to the next circle where the area library and the other museum and the older city buildings are. Through several small parks and down the long green aisle of General Astor's Way, purple in autumn with Michael Miss Daisies, some municipal gardener's idea of a joke, and then into the back streets of Charlie's neighborhood where everyone gets lost occasionally. Even people who have lived there all their lives, like Charlie and Mary and Kyoko. I was used to getting lost. I didn't mind. I'd come to something I recognized eventually. I wondered and thought about the latest thing I didn't want to think about. There seemed to be so many things I didn't want to think about lately. I didn't want to think about my increasing sense that something had happened to Khan and that it mattered. There is no fellowship between humans and vampires. We are fire and water, heads and tails, north and south, day and night. Maybe I was imagining the bond. Maybe it was a way of dealing with what had happened, like post-traumatic thing a gummy. Khan himself said the bond existed, but he could be wrong, too. Vampires are deadly, but no one says they're infallible. I blinked my treacherous eyes, watching the things in the shadows slitter and sparkle. I had plenty to worry about already. I didn't have to worry about vampires, too. One vampire. The last thing I wanted to be doing was worrying about him. No, the next to last thing. The last thing I wanted was to be bound to him. I hadn't thought I had any, did I mean innocence, to lose after those two nights on the lake. I didn't know you could go on finding out you'd had stuff by losing it. This didn't seem like a very good method to me. Over two months of being slowly poisoned, over two months of being slowly poisoned, probably hadn't been really good for me either, and the nightmares had been bad, but in a way they'd still been pure. I'd made a mistake, a mistake I'd paid dearly for, but it had been a mistake. A month ago, I'd called on Khan. Okay, I was at the end of my tether, but I'd still asked a vampire for help. Not Mel, not a human doctor of human medicine. And he'd helped me. The nightmares I'd had since weren't pure at all. My thought passed there, teetering on the edge of a pre precipice and then fell over. What if it hadn't been a mistake driving out to the lake? What if I'd had to do it, if not that exact thing, then something similar? What if that restlessness I hadn't been able to name had caused exactly what it was meant to cause? That question I hadn't asked Khan out by the lake is, is my dad another of your old enemies or your old friends? Beneath the dark thoughts inside my head and the leaping glittery shadows my eyes saw, I had to stop. I was at the edge of Old Roy's Park. I groped my way to a bench and sat down. I sat there and stared at the tree opposite me and the way the rough ridges of its bark seemed to wiggle where they lay in shade. My thoughts were stuck on that night at the lake. I never liked coincidence much, but I hated the sense I was making now. I watched the wiggling bark. It occurred to me that this was new. I'd been seeing into shadows, but merely what was there as if there was a rather erratic light on it. This was something else, which gave me something I could bear to think about, so I thought about it. A few more minutes passed, and it seemed to me it was as if I was watching the tree breathing. I found a leaf in shadow and looked at it for a while. It twinkled as if with tiny starbursts, but rather than thinking, ugh, weird, I kept watching, till there seemed to be a pattern. I thought, it's as if I'm watching its pores opening and closing. I looked down at my hands. The shadows between the fingers gleamed like a banked fire. 
The tiny shadows laid by the veins on the back of them on the backs of them were a tiny flickering dark green edged with a tiny here, even more flickering red. The daylight part of the veins looked as it always did. In the shadow places I could see the blood moving. I was sitting in sunlight, not shade. I automatically chose sun if there was any sun to be had. I remembered the sun on my back the first morning at the lake, like the arm of a friend. I closed my eyes. I heard the footsteps, but I didn't expect them to pause. Pardon me, said a voice. Are you all right? I opened my eyes. An old woman stood there, a little bent over, leaning on the handle of her two-wheeled shopping cart. You look tired, she said. Can I fetch you anything? There is a shop on the corner, and it has a payphone. Can I call someone for you? She had a nice face. She would be someone you would be glad to have as a neighbor or as a regular at the coffee house you and your family ran. I looked at the shadows that fell half across her face and saw, I don't know how, that she was a part blood and that something about my expression was maybe making her guess I might be going through finding that out about myself. And remembering how hard this was, she was going to ask me, a total stranger, if I was all right. I hauled myself back into the ordinary world, and the vision faded. The shadows that fell across her face reverted to being the usual, disorienting, see-through, funny-edged shadows I'd been seeing for a month. She smiled. I'm sorry to disturb you. I, er, I thought you might perhaps, er... Want to be disturbed, I said. Yes, isn't it silly how upsetting just thinking can be? It's not silly at all. The insides of our own minds are the scariest things there are. Scarier than vampires, I thought. Scarier than the, an affinity for vampires. Well, that was what she'd said, wasn't it? What my mind contained was an affinity for vampires. She was fishing around in her cart and pulled out a package of lab to do it in was confidential information. It still wasn't public knowledge where his lab had been, but Old Roy got the credit or the blame for the blood test SOF still used on job applicants. Before Old Roy, there was no reliable test for demon part bloods. Remember that demon is a hodgepodge word. Aware can't be a part blood. You either are one or you aren't. Anything else, anything alive that is, may be called a demon. Although things like Perry's and Angel's will probably protest. Pretty much the first thing that Old Roy discovered was that he was a part blood. He'd retired before they had a chance to throw him out and spent the last 20 years of his life breeding roses and naming them things like Lucifer, Mammon, Beelzebub, and Belphegor. Belphegor, under the less controversial name Pure of Heart, was a big commercial success. Mom had a pure of heart in her backyard. Old Roy may not have had a very happy life, but it sounded like he'd had a sense of humor. I wondered if he'd had anything to do with synthesizing the drug that made part bloods piss green or blue violet but pass his blood test, or of setting up the bootleg mentor system. Sometimes you have help, I said. Sometimes people come along and offer you chocolate pinwheels. Sometimes, she said. I'm Ray, I said. Do you know Charlie's Coffee House? It's about a quarter mile that way, I said, pointing. I don't get that far very often, she said. Well, sometime, if you want to, you might like to try our killer zebras. There's a strong family resem resemblance. 
Tell whoever serves you that sunshine says you can have as many as you can carry away to bring back to this park and eat in the sunshine. Are you sunshine then too? I sighed. Yes, I guess. I'm sunshine too. Good for you, she said, and patted my knee. I got home that night at about 9.30 and had a cup of cinnamon and rose hip tea and stared out at the dark and thought, there was at least one good result of my negative epiphany that afternoon in Old Roy Park. There seemed to me suddenly so many worse things that worrying about Khan seemed clean and straightforward. He had saved my life, after all, twice, never mind the extenuating circumstances. I stood on my little balcony and remembered, I could not come to you if you did not call me, but if you called, I had to come. Constantine, I said quietly into the darkness, do you need me? You have to call me if you do. You told me to rule yourself. He'd said Bo was after us and that Bo would make a move soon. I rather thought that soon in this instance meant a definition of soon that humans and vampires could agree on. Khan should have been back before now to tell me what was going on, what we were going to do, how far he'd gotten tracing Bo. He hadn't. There was something wrong. I slept badly that night, but this was getting to be so usual that it was an effort to try to decide if the nightmares I'd have were the kind I should pay attention to or not. I decided that they probably were, but I didn't know what kind of attention to pay, so I wasn't going to. I went into work, turned my brain off, and started making cinnamon rolls and garlic rosemary buns for lunch. Then I made brown sugar brownies, rocky road avalanche, killer zebras, and a lot of muffins, and then it was 10.30 and I had the lunch shift free. I had pulled the apron off and was about to untie my scarf when Mel's hand stopped me long enough for him to kiss the back of my neck. I shook my hair out and said yes, and we went back to his house together and spent some time on the roof. There's nothing nicer than making love outdoors on a warm, sunny day, and this late in the year it felt like getting away with something, too. Mel used to laugh sometimes right after he came in this gentle, surprised way as if he'd never expected to be this happy, and then he'd kiss me thoughtfully and I'd hang on to him and hope that I was reading the signs right. That afternoon was one of those times. He'd wound up on top, which I admit I had slightly engineered, since there was a bit of an autumnal breeze snaking around and it was nice and warm under Mel's body. His breath smelled of coffee and cinnamon. We lay there some time afterward. I loved that butterfly wings feeling of a hard on getting unhard inside me. And while we lay there, I was all right and the world was all right. And everything that might not be all right was on hold. And it was daylight and with my treacherous eyes shut, I could just lie there and feel the sunshine on my face. After a comfortable, rather dreamy lunch, he went downstairs to take apart or put together some motorcycle, and I went off to the library. I wanted to talk to Emil. She looked up from her desk, smiled faintly, and said, I have a break in a 40 minutes, and went back to whatever she was doing. I had a pass for the new shelves where there was a book hysterically titled The Scourge of the Other. It was a good two inches thick. I considered stealing it and putting it through the meat grinder at Charlie's, but the library would only buy another one, and the detritus of ink and binding glue probably wouldn't do the quality of Charlie's meatloaf any good. I knew without picking it up that the chapters would have rabble-rousing headings like The Demon Menace and The Curse of the Wearer. I wasn't going to guess what noun was desperate enough for vampires. Four months ago, I would have just scowled. Today, it gave me a hard knot and pit of stomach feeling. It was turning out I had a lot of other friends. And Con, of course, whatever he was. Con, are you all right? My tea was already steeping when I went back to the tiny staff kitchen to find a meal. So how did it happen, I said. She didn't bother to ask how did what happened. I knew about your SOFs at Charlie's because you told me about them. I told you so you wouldn't stop speaking to me because I seemed to like some guys who wore khaki and navy blue. That they were SOF was supposed to help. They told the best other stories. I guess. I could have done without the one. Never mind. Anyway, so I recognized them when they came here. One day Pat and Jesse asked if I'd come by the SOF office someday for a chat. I hadn't realized you could feel surrounded by two people, you know. And what was I going to say, no? So I said yes, and then they asked me if I'd be interested in doing a little work for SOF. 
And of course I said no, and then they started working around to telling me they weren't so interested that I was a reference librarian, as they were interested in what I was doing with other watch and beware. They seemed to know what I was doing at home, too, and before I totally freaked, Pat held his breath and turned blue. I said, what's to prevent me reporting you? And he said, because you're another one. I have no idea how they found out. Emile stopped, but she didn't stop like end of the story stop. And I said, she sighed, Ray, I'm sorry. They also said, because you're a friend of Sunshine's. There was no window in the little library staff kitchen. I wanted sunlight. What had my friendship to do with anything? She'd been working for SOF for almost two years. And you didn't tell me. Emil walked over to the door and closed it gently. I didn't want anyone to hear us either, but my spine started prickling with claustrophobia, or darkophobia anyway. <clears throat> I'm sorry, said Emil. It's only been since I've been working for them that I've started, have been able to start thinking of myself as other. As a part blood, the best way to pass is to believe in the role, you know. My parents know, of course, but they haven't made any attempt to find out where it comes from. None of my brothers had anything weird happen to them, and so